Hi everyone. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm so good. How are you? I'm good. It's great to be here today. Yeah, it's so good to see you. Yeah, you as well. Yeah, thanks. So thanks everyone for joining in. Um, welcome to another episode of Meaning and Reading. My guest this week is Olivia McCartney. Um, she's currently finishing her master's at the Butler School of Music with um, the amazing Dr. Andrew Parker. Um, and she earned her undergraduate degree at the Crane School of Music, where she studied with Dr. Anna Hendrickson. So thank you so much for joining for me, joining me today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to to nerd out with you. It'll be fun. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I guess let's just dive right into it. Um, let's start with um, Cane Brand and Gouge that you use. Yeah, um, I use an Inoletti Gouger. Um, I used a Ross Gouge pretty like, um, I, I, I didn't start using an Inoletti gouge until I started my master's degree. So I okay. used a Ross gouge pretty much uh, exclusively up until then. It's just like what was at um, our studio read room at Crane. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I find that the Inoletti is a little bit easier to get like a precise measurement across the board um, from nice. piece to piece. So that's kind of the main reason why I switched over. Um, and then I used Rigotti cane uh, exclusively also up until about like three weeks ago. And I, have um, been using Madeir cane um, okay. for the last couple of weeks. And the biggest change I've seen there is um, I find that the tone quality is like more consistent in Madeir compared mm. to Rigotti is like the biggest change I think I've seen. So I'm not sure if I'll stick with it, but um, I'm excited to like continue working with Madeir and see how that happens, how that grows with me. Yeah. I've heard some good things from people. Yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I'll have to try that at some point. I'm curious yeah. um, if you noticed like a difference in vibrancy between the Ross and the Inaletti. Um, I did. At the time where I switched over to Inaletti, there was like a lot of other elements of my read making that also changed, like how I was starting a blank. And mm -hmm. I was, as I entered my master's degree, I was becoming way more like refined and detailed. And as like Dr. Parker was kind of like seeing where I was with my um read making and then taking me like in the next uh direction and step so there's a lot changing there so i don't know if i could say like for sure that that was the cause of like more vibrancy but my reads have definitely yeah. become like more vibrant since starting my master's degree and using the inaletti nice that's awesome yeah cool nice i recently just purchased a a used inaletti i've been on the wait list for you know, a while, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I found a used one and I've, I've really been enjoying it. Um, they seem to vibrate just so readily. And I can just feel like I can make a read quickly without having to like really uh, finesse, you know, the read into vibrating how I want it to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Cool. And so what about staple and shape? Um, I use a Chirugi number uh, 47, number two staple um, brass. Um, I've experimented with the metal staples for Chirugi. Um, mm -hmm. Haven't really had too much luck and pretty much just use, yeah, like just the cork Chirugi staples. Um, and then for shape, I use a Gilbert minus one. Um, okay, nice. Yeah. And I'll speak a little bit more later um, if we talk about like climate change and stuff, but my shape has also <laughs> changed since moving to Austin. So yeah. yeah yeah that's so that's so interesting someone said i'm on the wait list too yeah i feel you um <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> the wait list is long yeah cool so um how how have you um liked the chirurgies compared to what you've used in the past um they're way more consistent and i i like the two i think it's like a great like average opening um i use the my staple has moving from like potsdam to to austin um, and I can't even really speak to what I used to use before the Chirugis, um, cause I, I started using Chirugis in my sophomore year of undergrad. And before then, I think I was just, um, 
using like staples that my professor would give me. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. not even sure like what brand they were. So yeah, I'm pretty yeah. like set on my yeah. staple though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Yeah. And I think when we all like start out, we all just kind of use whatever we can get our hands <laughs> on, you know, or like yeah, old exactly. staples we have. Yeah. <laughs> what nice. staple do you use? I use the Gloten uh, Silver 47 millimeter. Okay. Yeah, that's my like go to um, just I always get pretty good results from it. I've been experimenting a lot recently, just because I have the time. Um, <laughs> so I've been like, I've been trying some 46 millimeter Gloten, some Stevens number four. Um, I actually have not tried an Inchi Ruby yet, which um, everyone's really enjoying them. So I need to, to try them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what was I going to say about staples? Oh, I've been meaning to try the Loray. Like I play on an uh, Loray AK oboe. Mm -hmm. And so I've been meaning to try their like AK staple. Cause mm -hmm. I've heard yeah. that the way the staple is constructed, like works with the bore of the, the instrument very well. Yeah. Um, I haven't tried it, but that's been something I've heard and kind of wanted to dig into a little bit in my remaking. Yeah. That's I'm, I'm really curious about that too. Yeah. Let me know yeah. if you do try them. Yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Um, well, that that was one question we had, what you mentioned, um, climate. So like, I know you, you originally from New York. Um, and so now you live in Texas. So what was that difference? Like, you know, how did you adjust your reads? Yeah, um, it definitely got easier when I moved to Texas. Um, mm -hmm. I started making reads in college, pretty much. So I was up in Potsdam, New York, which is uh, like almost to Canada. Uh, like 40 minutes from the border so really north and the winters are really brutal up there it would get to like yeah. negative 20 at night so wow <laughs> um, so yeah lord and, yeah <laughs> and then the the winter season which in Potsdam pretty much goes from like mid November to April is mm -hmm. just like really dry and um like it is the driest climate I have ever lived in um <laughs> you could leave like your just soaked read out for like one minute and it would pretty much be drinking and you oh, have to soak it. so yeah oh <laughs> justin says it's lord in pots damn right now <laughs> um wow so, <laughs> yeah uh justin is my is my colleague from undergrad he's a junior i think this year so um anyways nice. uh yeah, so I used to use when I was in Potsdam, and of course, you know, I was early in my remaking, so I was kind of trying out like a lot of things to see what worked for me. So I went yeah. through like a Caleb minus one where I used that a lot. Um, I used a Mac plus shape for a little bit, um, but I tended to find that the wider shapes worked better up in the dry and really cold climate. So I ended up purchasing and using pretty much my like junior and senior year pretty consistently um a nagamatsu minus one i believe it is shape which i've okay. kind of found is pretty like not it's pretty rare like among oboists like i don't mm -hmm. i haven't really run into a lot of people that like use them consistently um but i just found that the wider shape kind of helped with vibrancy up in the cold climate i'm not sure like quite exactly why um and then i also would use 10 to 10.5 cane um to help with uh openings because if you use like a I found that if I used a wider width of cane my reeds were like super super closed um gotcha. just because yeah. of the weather I think affected that um so then when I moved down here um things just became like a lot easier it's way more like uh consistently humid here we have days where it's um really, really humid and days where it's really dry, but for mm. the most part, it stays like the humidity stays the same. And um, the summers are hard because they're really hot, but yeah. um, the winters are like super mild. It's like 70 out right now and it's March. Wow, so, yeah, <laughs> that sounds course, lovely. <laughs> of course, yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to jinx another uh, Texas winter storm that did happen. <laughs> um, yeah. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so then I, I had to, my reeds were then really flat here with my wide shape. Mm. So I had to get a new shape. Um, and my professor uses a, a Gilbert minus one. Um, so he recommended that to me. And I tried out a couple other shapes that the studio had um, and found consistency with the Gilbert. So I just bought myself a tip. Um, nice. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I just found that it's way easier to make a read more consistently like a similar read every time here whereas I struggled to um make my reads very consistent up in undergrad which might be to like 
my lack of read making technique and just like I've mm. grown a lot and learned a lot since moving down here but um but yeah um that's kind of the biggest I guess climate related change in my remaking since starting grad school nice that's awesome that's great advice I think for anyone who's struggling mm -hmm. um and actually, yeah, one of our questions was, um, one of our submitted questions was that someone's having um, issues with their reads being too closed and not vibrant enough. Um, mm -hmm. So what you're saying is like, you know, maybe try a smaller diameter, you get it a little bit more open. Um, and maybe, you know, depending on where you live, maybe a slightly narrower shape. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious about the Gilbert minus one. That's one I have never tried. Um, okay. and it's a little bit more on the narrower side, right? But yeah. um, I don't think I've tried anything quite that narrow yet. Um, do you have a, ever have issues like getting the depth that you want out of the read? Yeah, I do. I, that's something I've actually been struggling with recently in my read making mm -hmm. is being able to have a read that's stable, oops, sorry, stable in its like pitch and I don't have to work to like maintain and keep the pitch up especially in the high register, but also be able to have like the depth and flexibility to like have a dynamic range and also be yeah. able to have my low notes really resonant and sing. So yeah, I've been trying to play around with um, like how thin or thick my heart is and also like my back of the read, like taking more out than usual or taking less. And um, yeah. yeah, I've been focusing a lot on the blend of the back to the heart a lot because I feel like that, that does play a, a role in it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I tend to make that area very, very smooth um, mm -hmm. and very connected. What do you do for that section? Yeah, I try and make it really smooth. Um, Dr. Parker talks a lot about the uh, profile view of your read. Um, let me grab. Um, so he wants, he always talks about it as like a, like a bottleneck kind of yeah. shape that we want it to be like really smooth and curve so I try I've been trying to like get this boxiness that I find in my reads so this is a read that I made recently see if I can okay nice yeah I can kind of see that yeah which it's not as um refined in mine yet it's just something I'm working on but mm. I have a read here which is a little bit better I'm not sure if you can totally see the difference there but a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah it looks more like, like, yeah. Yeah, just like really like, almost just like smooth, like clay, like scooping, like, but in a really smooth way and making that like connection between the two really like beautiful and like artistic almost in a way. And mm, I, I nice. just found that the like better your read looks in the profile view in terms of like how like smooth it looks, um, the better like it is just overall. So, yeah. of course. You know, we all have those reads, which looks like <laughs> like a toddler scraped on it, and they work beautifully. So <laughs> right, like yes, a, yeah, hundred percent statement, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, but no, that's great <laughs> advice, and I think especially for like um, younger read makers, because when I was younger, I didn't really didn't look at the profile that much. You know, I mostly looked at it straight on. That's really, you know, it's just staring at it like this. You know, but mm -hmm. taking other angles really helps. Um, you know, it gives you a picture of of <laughs> what in the read is not symmetrical and. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, nice. Um, another thing I would say for the opening, whoever submitted that question, is to play around with like how long you tie your blanks. Um, yeah. I used to tie mine at 72, and then now I, I tie them at 73, and I found that that actually, well, I was having a too open problem when I moved here, so I started tying it longer. So I would say maybe experiment tying it at 72 or shorter um, if they tie it longer than 72. Um, yeah. that could be like a potential factor in that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great advice as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, I find that 73 is kind of like that sweet spot, you know? Yeah. Um, sometimes, sometimes 72 and a half, but I find when I, when I tie at 72, I get, especially here in Seattle, I get stuff that's a little bit too open. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So how, um, how many oboists are in your studio? Um, we have... I believe 14, potentially 15. Okay. Yeah. We have uh, four graduate students, three masters, including myself, and one DMA, um, two seniors, so that's six. Um, and then our junior class is four, I believe. Sophomores are four, and freshmen is two. So wow. 
It's okay. pretty kind of like even-ish across the board, <laughs> I yeah. guess. That's yeah. That's sizable. Nice. Yeah, it's like a nice size. I feel like we all um, definitely have a chance to get to know each other. Um, yeah. And it's like small enough to like have the community feel, but big enough to have like a diverse like thought, like mm. just like a diverse group of people. So I think it's a nice. great size. I think 15 is like an awesome size for a studio. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. yeah. And how does that compare to um, your undergrad? Um, it's pretty similar. Um, one year at Crane, we had, um, I think it was my sophomore year, the class that was seniors that year was pretty sizable. So when they graduated, we didn't have quite as many like incoming freshmen fill up their spots. Mm -hmm. So that was a small year. I think we were down to like nine or 10. Um, but okay. then the class after that is like, was a big class again. So then it went back up to around like the 12, 15 range. Yeah. Nice. So pretty similar. Yeah. Nice. Are y'all having like virtual uh, read room <laughs> classes? <laughs> yeah, we've been doing that more so um, this semester. Nice. Um, we've been after studio class, like sometimes we'll, we'll all Zoom or whoever's free or sometimes we have like a Facebook group chat that we all are in and someone will put like hey i'm doing this tonight does if anyone wants to hop on zoom with me like would love to Aww. to hang out so <laughs> yeah i yeah. love that <laughs> yeah i miss the, so the read room chats and hangs and just being able to like make reads with <laughs> another oboist yes yeah. well, that was honestly one of my favorite my favorite things about college and summer festivals was like late nights in the read room you know yeah <laughs> You can learn like so much from just scraping on a read with your with your colleagues in the studio. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, where did you go to to undergrad again? I went to the uh, University of Washington um, up here in Seattle. Okay, yeah, that's right. Um, where I studied. Yeah, I studied with Mary Lynch. Um, I really enjoyed. Um, college up here I actually originally went to UW um, that's what we call it UW uh, mm -hmm. for for nursing um, and music was just going to be kind of my uh, I was going to double major and you know and, and uh, <laughs> it didn't work out that way um, you know it once you're in college it's it's kind of it's difficult to double major um, <laughs> especially depending on the, the school you go to um, so it became clear that like, hey, I need to pick one and go with it. And so I rolled the dice and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Mary Lynch came to the UT studio last semester for a oh, nice. virtually. Yeah, it was really cool to to like hear her teach. I didn't play in the master class, but obviously like some of my um colleagues in the studio did and yeah she had some really great like insight and I totally didn't even put two and two together at the before the master class but then she referenced it in the class how she is like in that video with um Albert Meyer on YouTube yeah the master class. she's like famous for all the oboists know about that right um, yes and I was like oh my gosh that's where like I recognize you from yeah um, no <laughs> so <laughs> funny story is that when I was starting at UW, it was supposed to be another like local oboe teacher, um, but she had to, um, she wasn't going to be teaching that year. So she said, you know, there's someone great coming in. Um, she just won the principal oboe of Seattle. So you should be in good hands. And I didn't, didn't connect who it was. And I walked into my first lesson and I was like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> I recognize <laughs> you from this Albrecht Meyer master class. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's, that's going to be my teacher. And I was like <laughs> blown away. Um, but yeah, she she's great. I'm I'm excited or, or happy that you got to to work for work with her a little bit. Yeah, it was great. So, what is your um, read making process? You said that that's kind of changed over the past few years. Yeah. Um. So, in undergrad, I um with a blank. I guess like the biggest thing that's changed is besides like my shape and the climate down here in Austin um, mm -hmm. is how I scrape a blank and how I like start a read and bring it to like a day one read. Um, so in undergrad, I would pretty much just tie a read, um, scrape a little bit off the tip 
and then let, let it sit in my case overnight. And then the next day, take like two big like channels out of the reed from the back. Um, and then scrape down the tip a bit and clip it open and not it wouldn't like vibrate right away when I opened it, which I guess is like, I guess part of the biggest change. Um, mm -hmm. And I would let that sit and then go back and scrape and to bring everything down until it was working as an oval reed should. Um, yeah. But now I take like way more cane off than I used to before I even clip the reed open. Nice. Um, so I'll start with the tip. Um, and I, I'm just scraping off and making that nice and thin and trying to have it like taper really nicely down. Um, and then I'll go into the heart um, and just get the bark off and then into the back. And that's where I start to put in like that little like waste to the root, I guess you could call it. Um, and then kind of scrape down each section again until it starts having that like bottleneck shape that I talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, and then once it like looks like it has been scraped down enough and there's no like real bark left on the reed, there's still like usually a little bit on the sides of the heart and a little bit in the center of the heart. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course like the rails, but, um, and then I'll clip it open. And basically the goal when you clip it open is for it to vibrate like a really like with resistance, but still able to like take the air um, and yeah. have like a high pitched kind of soft like vibration um, and then you just kind of like take down each section I put in the the tip and let it sit overnight um, so that's nice. pretty much such changes it's way more of a read like in the first day than my other reads used to be yeah I think that, that sounds really similar to, to what I do mm -hmm. um, yeah I find that I, I've you know sometimes I will jump back and forth between the old way of like just scraping off the bark, clipping open and letting it sit for a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But I do find whenever I switch back to scraping more out for day, like the day one, I just get more vibrancy in the reed and, and more life um, immediately, you know, and yeah, um, there's something so satisfying about it just <laughs> working so much sooner, you know? Yeah. yeah. I found that it, um, it's easier to take cane off before you clip it open, especially like in the tip than it is mm. after the reed is clipped open. Agreed, I'm not yeah. sure like if that's more of like a mental thing that I just think that is easier, so it is, or if that's like actually a true fact, but um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But, what is a true fact in reed making? Right, oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are none, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the um, two true facts in reed making are one, that you can't tie over your staple, otherwise the reed is yes. gonna be choked, and two, that you need a sharp knife. Other yes. Than that, okay. Yes. I'm like, I'm like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everything else is up for question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So your friend asked, um, "Do you find being flexible in reed making helped you create more consistent reads, or vice versa?" Um. Do I find being flexible? Uh. Yes. Yes and no. Like I think. Yeah. <laughs> um being able to have a perspective when I'm having a trouble, trouble with a read where I'm able to like, kind of think like, what are my possibilities here that I know to like, that might work to make this read better. So um, I'm trying to think of an example. Like, for example, if I'm not getting like a low crow, or if I when I'm playing a read and the low notes like aren't speaking or aren't really like are, are really tough to get out so obviously I know that's like something to do with probably the back of the heart like maybe my heart to tip to yeah heart to tip ratio isn't right yet there's like too mm -hmm. much on the heart or like the back to the heart ratio is off or the back to like the rest of the read so just yeah. kind of taking like my options that I know have worked in the past and then just like trying to use my best like educated guess and what um, what would work best has helped me make consistent reads and not ever thinking of something being like a true hard like yes this is going to work because sometimes like it's not going to work so right. I think you do have yeah. to be flexible in the way you approach things um, and the way you make decisions about what you do um, yeah so yeah I guess yeah yes and no <laughs> yeah I totally agree yeah I, I think definitely like in terms of the decision making about what you want to do is being flexible is great because sometimes, you know, you'll approach a read. Okay. I think it is the hardest too thick. Um, and I need to take a dusting off. And so maybe you do that and then it still feels the same. I don't, I wouldn't go back to the heart if it didn't make a difference, you know, 
So I think being yeah, flexible yeah. in that, like, okay, something else is going on here. I need to figure out what that is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also being flexible in terms of like what you want your read to look like, because ideally, you know, it should look, ideally you want it to look good, but um, you know, being married to that is not always the healthiest thing. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And also, yeah, de going off of that, just like I've definitely struggled in the past with like fraying my tips or like losing the side. And mm -hmm. sometimes if I, that happens like early on in my process, I'll sometimes just be like, this read isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. But like thinking back, like I've had so many instances where like a tiny little bit of the tip has been missing and the read has been really, really great or like one of the yeah. best reads I've ever played on. And so like never taking something as like an end all be all. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, no, I have um, today, I'm actually like just scraping on some reads that I put in my like, <laughs> my B pile. So like, if I start working on a read, and it just doesn't want to settle. Um, <laughs> before I like do crazy too much, I might just like put it aside. And then, you know, when I have free time, or like a little bit of time that I want to troubleshoot, I can just whip one of those reads out and maybe it'll turn out. Um, yeah, so I find that helpful. Like if, if something's not going right, just put it away or, you know, don't, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't try to fix the problem immediately. Yeah. Um, and reads really yeah. do have to just hang out sometimes, like in order to fix themselves. I yeah. found like sometimes I'll, I mean, every oboist I feel like always has those like filler reads in their case, which like, they're probably never really going to play, but if you don't want to like totally like, um, take their life away yet and so sometimes right. I'll just like go through my read case and be like okay it's time to like purge reads that aren't going to work like I need room in my case for more stuff um yep. and I'll go through and I'll play on some reads and be like wait this one definitely wasn't working in the way I wanted it to a week ago and now like that I haven't touched it in a week it's settled and right. I feel like this has potential and I'll scrape and then sometimes those end up being like great reads that I end up playing yeah. on stuff like that so yeah, yeah I love that yeah, sometimes you'll pull one out and you're like, why is this in this pile? Like, why did I decide this is not a good read? Yeah. 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 So. Angela said, um, hi, Angela. Uh, been trying some crazy things with my reads lately. Totally agree with only true things being not over tying and having a sharp knife. Definitely mm -hmm. agree. Yeah. She also said, I have a B pile too. I call it timeout, <laughs> which <laughs> I, love I love that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, I was just going to ask you something, but I forgot what it was. It will come to me again. Yeah. I, I had a question for you. Um, yeah. I just heard you sharpening a knife. What what kind of knives do you use? <laughs> oh, yeah. I use a Chirugi double hollow ground for my, like, um, initial scrapes on the nice. reed, like my bark knife. Um, and then I have a Charles Double Reed Company double hollow mm. ground, um, a Landwell medium double hollow ground. And one more, <laughs> a Nielsen uh, double hollow ground knife as well. Nice. That's awesome. So the Nielsen is actually like basically brand new. I bought it a couple weeks ago. Um, I was going through like a, I can't get my knife sharp enough uh, crisis. <laughs> and so my Charles Double Reef Company I've had for years, like since my sophomore, junior year of undergrad. Wow. Okay. Um, and I kind of stopped using it like when I moved here, I think because I couldn't get an edge on it and... I didn't really know what to do. So I just let it like hang out in my desk. Mm -hmm. um, and I had just purchased a landmill. So I was like, okay. But then my landmill recently, I couldn't get an edge on it. So I sent them both off to be uh, reground. And they just got nice. back here on Friday. So that's exciting. Um, and in the meantime is when I bought the Nielsen so that I had a knife to like get me through that, that time that my knives were away. That's awesome. Yeah. Nice. So where did, where did you send it to get uh, reground? Um, I sent it to my friend, Matt Langus. He was the okay. DMA candidate here, like, the year before I started. Um, and, yeah, he, he did it for me, so. That's awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. He's nice. great. Great oboist, great person, too. Nice. Um, and then for my, I sharpen my knives with um, the Dan's Whetstones, like, the Soft Arkansas. Um, is that what it's called? Hang on, let me do yeah soft arkansas stone and then i also have a like a really fine black one which i use like once or twice a month just to like reinforce the edge um but i pretty much nice. use all the time every day my rod i love 
the rod for sharpening, I like swear by it. It's made my nice. knives so much more consistent and sharp for sure. So, nice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I used to use a uh, ceramic, the ceramic rod, um, which is <laughs> sizable, but um, and it, it's fine. But I recently switched to this um, sharpening steel, which mm, is fine because nice, it yeah. also looks like a sword. But um, <laughs> it does look like a sword. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I find it really helps. And it, like, I find a knife that really should be reground, I can still get an edge on it um, mm -hmm. with a nice steel, um, which is such a blessing, you know, to not have to <laughs> regrind as often. Yeah, for sure. Um, um, what knife do you use? Um, so I mostly use the Harvard Double Reeds um, um, knives, the beveled knives. Um, and I have that system as well, that sharpening system. And that, that's primarily what I use. And I have some other um, beveled knives that I use. Um, I have a mix, mixture of some Landwells and an <laughs> old, like, herder knife, Philadelphia herder knife. Um, mm -hmm. That's um, an older oboist, like an amateur oboist gave to me. Like, there's her old, like, uh, <laughs> like remaking box. So I have some old knives that I've reground. Um, I also recently like um, got the Wicked Edge system. So that's been fun to kind of, you know, revive old blades that I thought were goners. Yeah, um, it's yeah. always exciting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's exciting, yeah, for sure. Um, but I kind of go back and forth. I mostly start with the beveled knives um, towards the beginning. And then when I'm doing like really, really fine um, finishing of my reads, I'll switch to something lighter, like a, a double hollow ground or mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. How um how has it been for you, or do you have like um, advice for uh, oboists who are young, like like us, um, who mm -hmm. have I don't know if you have students. I'm guessing you probably, you have students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I also have students and sometimes I find it hard to like manage my own reads, but also make reads for my students. And I'm wondering if you have like advice on how you organize that in your life. Yeah, no, that's, um, so I, I also, I run a read business as you know, um, mm -hmm. and it's been a challenge, I would say, you know, over the past, you know, six months or so that we've been open, uh, to kind of balance my own remaking with, you know, selling reads. Um, and I wish I had a better answer, honestly. Um, but <laughs> my answer is just to make reads all the time, <laughs> which yeah. is not a great answer. But um, yeah, I make a lot of reads. And then, you know, sometimes I will keep, you know, the best read, you know, if, I, if I'm making a read, and luckily, I make the reads to sell and my own reads the same. So if one of them is mm -hmm. really great, I'll stick it into my read case. Um, but that's not always the case, you know, and the difficult thing about making reads for other people is that reads don't always turn out, right? So sometimes you'll make a batch and, you know, three or four of them don't turn out. And so you have to <laughs> go at it again. Um, so you can't always end up keeping the reads that you want to keep. Um, so yeah, my advice would be just to make more reads, <laughs> which is not, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is not probably not what people want to hear, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about you? How do you manage that? Um, so I, right now, uh, which I really only started making reads for my students in like August, September. Um, I just got a huge, like I, I only had six students last year and then I now teach 20 students. So, mm. um, and most of them are wow. new. Um, I would say like a, two thirds of them are new. I have a couple students that, um, stayed with me for the year um and that's really exciting for me and I don't make reads for all of them um but I do for some and um I use a just like a different staple um that's just like a cheaper like to buy staple basically so I can like keep the price down for nice. the, the reads um and so that can be challenging sometimes because when I'm tying I'm like tying reads for me tying reads for my students and I know that they're like reads for me and reads for my students because like they look different um and so that has been challenging and interesting because sometimes I find that if I'm going through kind of like a bad read time or where I feel like I can't really like make a read of high level for myself 
mm. I'll still be able to make reads for my students. And I'm wondering if it's like, cause I'm kind of removed from, I know yeah. this is for me. Um, this is like a product I'm giving to someone else and selling to them. So, so yeah, that's been interesting for me, but I've also just like always had student reads tied in my, in my box, in my case, I mean, and just like, always scraping down reads and yeah just trying to make reads all the time (laughs) nice yeah no that's interesting that you bring that up though because I find that uh, myself that sometimes I'm making student reads and because there are student reads I'm you know maybe just going through the motions a little faster than I Mm -hmm. normally would for my own reads um and sometimes they end up being some of the best reads (laughs) yeah um and they're like on student staples and I'm like why is this like so good (laughs) um and it's I don't know it just gives you kind of an insight into like how our own, you know, like perception of what we're making or creating um, mm-hmm. can affect the final result. Yeah, yeah, totally. But I really like making reads for my students. I think reads have been the hard, the biggest challenge for like virtual teaching for me because yeah, well, and because of the nature of our instrument and everything has to be so like fine tuned correctly on yeah. the instrument itself to function um, in the correct way. So with like beginner students, it's really hard sometimes to be like, uh, okay, so it's either you, your read or your instrument that's causing this problem. Um, and it's in a normal time where I'd be with them, I would just take my read, put it on their instrument, play it. Okay. The instrument works. It's not that. And, you know, try and like rule out everything. Um, but being with just you know I'm in my room on a computer and they're in their room on a computer it's hard to sometimes have them like test and for me to get a good understanding of like what's causing the problem um right so yeah I've become very creative and I've trusted younger students to like do things to their read to make it help them and normally I'm like you don't ever touch your read like yeah yeah, just so yeah 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 nice yeah that's been an interesting challenge for sure um, I started like someone on the oboe during the pandemic, which um, yes. <laughs> was just like very, very challenging because, you know, talking about embouchure, like even like, you know, seeing their embouchure through, you know, Zoom is like sometimes challenging. And then seeing, you know, you can't see what other extra fingers they're hitting. So sometimes mm-hmm. they're like, no, I'm not hitting anything extra, but they're actually hitting like <laughs> a bunch of like the side octave key or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. The side key and the side A flat key have been the two most yeah. hit, hit <laughs> extra keys <laughs> on accident. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a fun challenge, you know, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Was your beginner like young in age or were they like in high school? Um, yeah, she's in, she's fairly young. She's, um, I think she's in seventh grade. Okay. Um, so yeah, she's still. She's she's enjoying it though, which is good. So <laughs> if you can enjoy the oboe, you know, without any like hands on help, then something's going good. You're yeah. Doing something right. So. <laughs> oh, and also, so in our in our call, you mentioned that the oboe was your first and only wind instrument, right? Yes. Um, I... That's awesome. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I grew up in New York, and New York and Texas, I'm not sure how it compares to, like, other states, but it's very, it functions very different here in Texas than how I grew up, which has Mm -hmm. been cool to, like, experience since I moved down here, Um, but in New York, when I was in elementary school, we started instruments in fourth grade, Um, so in third grade, you would do, like, the instrument petting zoo, and... Mm -hmm they would have like high schoolers come in and show us each instrument and that whole thing. Um, And so I was, I am the youngest of three. I have three older siblings and they all played musical instruments um, from like a very musical family. Um, And so when it came time, I was like, I'm going to play the flute. They're like, no, everyone plays the flute. You shouldn't do that. And I was like, okay, I'm going to play the clarinet. And they're like, but everyone also plays the clarinet. Like you should play the oboe. (laughs) And my sister's friend, (laughs) Um, at the time, like, also played the oboe, and she was in high school, and we had gone to a high school band concert, and my sister was sitting next to me, I think, and she was like, you hear that? That's, like, the oboe solo. Like, that's Carrie. She's playing that. So I was like, oh, that sounds cool, and I think it was, like, a couple weeks later, I put oboe, then French horn, and then saxophone. Those were, like, my three in order of what I wanted to play. So Nice. Um, 
Yeah, and then, I mean, no one really wanted to play the oboe, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, and then I started, and and it was great. And um, I started private lessons, like, really shortly after that. Within, I think, the first year, or definitely in my second year with the instrument. Um, so, yeah, it's been taking private lessons for a really long time. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. that. You said something like 13 years, or? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And I would imagine I started when around age 10. So yeah, something nice. like 13 years. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah I went it's so through, rare. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I went through like three teachers in from when I started to when I graduated high school, which was cool. Um, the first one like kind of started me on the instrument. And then the second one really like took me to the next like level. And then when I was getting ready to go to college, my last like two years of high school, I studied with like a college professor in our area who played in like more serious orchestras and stuff. And um, he really like brought me to the next level for where I need nice. to be for college. So yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I feel lucky for being able to like have all those experiences growing up and um, being able to like take private lessons and stuff like that. Yeah, that's great. No, it's so great and, and so rare to have someone, you know, start on oboe alone, you know, not having played mm -hmm. something else. Um, yeah. There was one time where I, um, I think I was in seventh grade and I really wanted to, I thought the bassoon was really interesting and was mm -hmm. like interested in maybe switching over to bassoon. And <laughs> um, I'm not sure why, but I, don't know if like my mom didn't want me to switch over or if my private teachers and my mom like thought I was like naturally really good at the oboe and they thought that like that was a better thing for me but my mom was like oh like we don't think you can because your hands are too small which is funny because I have like really like large hands yeah, um, my mom's <laughs> yeah. so I definitely got her hands um nice. and <laughs> so it's funny because I have since like played the bassoon a little bit just for fun and mm. uh, my hands are actually like, too big for the instrument I have to have one of those wow. like, fenders so yeah oh lord <laughs> that's so funny <laughs> yeah nice Perfect. oh another good question we had um was what is the best read that you've ever had or that you can remember Great. That's a great question. Um, I would say the best read I've ever played on, which I didn't make, um, my teacher made, and it was the fall, end of the fall semester of my uh, graduate degree, so like December of 2019, mm -hmm. and we would do um, a oboe like studio recital every semester, typically, um, and so on the recital, I played on this read, and I played Black and Enemies um, by Schwatner, which is uh, mm, actually yeah. good, but I played on oboe. And um, yeah, the read just felt so like responsive and flexible, yet warm and stable. And it was just like the perfect like balance of everything that we want in a read. And that's definitely the best read I've ever played on, I think, nice. before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, best read I've ever made was probably uh the end of last semester for my like mock audition um that I just had to do for my my lessons um yeah it was just the best read I've ever made with everything was just looked great and it looked really good um it's played really well so yeah nice nice yeah cool. I would say mine um it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to pick one you know sometimes um I think the best one I I played and, and made was um I guess a few years ago um I was playing the principal on the barber violin concerto with oh, nice. um an orchestra around here and um yeah I just I remember making a ton of reads for that <laughs> and um I ended up playing one that was actually somewhat old um and was quite ugly um, <laughs> but <laughs> but it just it allowed me to just kind of sing through the instrument and and play that that solo um the second movement solo with just so much ease and um like range of of color and and sound yeah and that's yeah. totally you definitely want like a read that just lets you play it without just like really working to like right. hold up the pitch and stuff yeah 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 i missed that read
Yeah. Um, I think that's like another thing that's really changed in my read making since moving to Austin is a really, and in my playing, not even really related to reads, but we've been working a lot on like tone production and mm -hmm. working less to create like a better result because I would, I hold a lot of body tension, which I'm trying to work on releasing when I play. Yeah. Um, and I, I would just like hold so much and like manipulate with my embouchure so much to get the read to work in the way I wanted it to. Yeah. And so through making my reads like more consistent, more stable, I have to like work less with my embouchure and in turn get like a better cut tone color and resonance and all of that stuff. Um, and I'm trying to think where I was going with this, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so my reads have just become more stable and definitely can just like hold themselves up to pitch better than, what I used to make back in Potsdam, so. Nice, yeah, I think that's a, a skill that I think we'll probably be developing for the rest of <laughs> our lives, right? Like how to find that balance when testing a read, like how do I make sure I'm not manipulating it in some way? Mm -hmm. um, which I think is a really important skill, especially for younger read makers um, yeah. to develop, yeah. And something I've like noticed with school being like online and having less, like, availability to play on like our our peers reads and like our teachers reads and stuff yeah. which I I used to play on like my friends reads all the time just like in the read room to just see like hey what do you think of this you know um and of course like Dr. Parker would always play on my reads and my lessons to make sure like to see how they felt to him and yeah. I think the like lack of opportunity to feel like another person's reads it kind of does take like a awareness out like I think I recently just like purchased some reads just to like see and compare for myself. And yeah. I did realize like I'm going, I'm kind of reverting back and I am, I'm still like working too hard with my, the reads I'm making right now. And it's just really good to like play on someone else's reads and be reminded like, okay, this is like my goal. That's what that feels like. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah that's definitely. what I've noticed. And I definitely recommend to people to just like order a couple of reads from somewhere just because like, it's good to just experience like another person's read making yeah that's great yeah. advice and I think so many people are like oh I would never like order reads you know I yeah. only make my own but I think you know for the purpose of like you're saying seeing where you're at seeing how your reads mm -hmm. compare to someone else's I think is really important yeah um, and especially just like if you're in school and like in a time where like you are still like work really working on your read making and trying to like refine that skill to be like of the highest level just um yeah, don't be afraid to just like order some reads just to see where you are. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And try to learn, like even if the read doesn't work well for you, try to learn something from the read, mm -hmm. you know? Like maybe yeah. it, it doesn't work well, but it has great response or something, or doesn't work great for you, but it has a phenomenal tone or something, you know? Um, there's always mm -hmm. something you can learn from yeah. someone else's reads. Absolutely. What is the, um, I forget the name of it, that you, you tie your reads with it, it's like clear? Yeah, so it's monofilament nylon. Um, right. And so basically what it is, is rather than most nylon that we use for reads um, is braided nylon. So it's just like tiny little strands of nylon that have been braided together. Um, mm -hmm. And this is just one continuous strand of thicker nylon. Okay. Um, so the idea being that it doesn't uh, hinder like as many vibrations in the read. Um, and I find that to be true. Um, I don't, <laughs> some people um, really enjoy it. Other people don't notice much of a difference. Um, but I, I really enjoy tying reads with the, and it looks cool, which is kind of a, <laughs> a silly reason, but it does look neat. Um, and yeah, I've, I've really been enjoying, enjoying making reads with it. Yeah, that's awesome. They do look really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I've been trying a bunch of different, like, um, manufacturers and seeing which ones work the best. Um, and I think it did take me a little bit of, like, um, searching and experimenting, but I, I think I found one that, that vibrates really well and is strong and doesn't break easily and doesn't stretch too much, which is also very important. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of thread do you use? Um, I've been using from RDG. They have like a line of like 
Marigo, uh, Loray, Fox. They're all just like named after Obo brands. Um, oh, nice. Color. So like this is Marigo because it's red. Um, oh, okay, cool. Change. Yeah, it's the double E or double F. Whatever like the um, most common is, is what I've been using okay. recently. Yeah. And I, I, I do use beeswax. I know some people don't use beeswax, but that is something I, I do. Yeah, nice. What was your like motivation to um, start like your read business and is, do you work with like other people on it? And yeah, just tell me about that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, let's see. I started it last um, August, July, August, late, late July. Um, and I guess I had multiple reasons for wanting to start it. Number one, I, wasn't working so i play in two orchestras in the like washington state um, mm -hmm. and neither of them are playing at all or even really doing much virtual stuff so i wanted to do something to <laughs> to fill my days um and there's only so much like motivation that can bring you know i can practice all all day but you know sometimes that just isn't enough right i need some, yeah. some more structure something else to to do um so I started for that reason, um, but I also wanted to, so the kind of unique angle that we're approaching reads um, is where I'm um, using machine learning to learning to kind of learn more about the read making process and um, like how certain things affect the final outcome. So basically what that means is that I take um, a lot of data points, um, like over 40 data points for almost every read um, which is <laughs> quite tedious. Um, but um, basically what that will do is it, it feeds this machine learning um, model and that uh, model will go over the data millions and millions of times. Um, so, and it, it'll catch like patterns and trends that we wouldn't notice just, you know, writing it down in a read journal. So it's kind of like a read journal, you know, expanded. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was, another one of the motivation motivating factors um was because i was just already taking a lot of data and so i was like you know what i can sell the reads that i'm taking all the data on and um kind of feed this model um so i've been enjoying that um and they also the other motivation was meeting and reading um i wanted like a way to connect with other people and i thought and this will be like it'll all just kind of tie in nicely you know i can um, sell reads and then meet with people every week and talk about reads and all that jazz. So, um, yeah, I've been, I've been really enjoying it. It's given yeah. me something to do. <laughs> yeah. That's really, really cool good. and interesting yeah. about the, like all the data and stuff like that. Yeah. That's be really beneficial. Like after, you know, a whole year of, of taking data and looking at it. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. it's definitely like the only, um, like downside I would say is that machine learning requires a lot of data. So I like <laughs> will be collecting data for probably the rest of my life, you know, and, and <laughs> by the end of my life, I'll have something that I can publish, you know, that mm -hmm. shows, you know, these connections of, you know, this is a trend that happens whenever it's too, you know, the gouge is too inconsistent, this happens or yeah. like that. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 excited for you know future patterns and trends that will evolve out of this data collection. Yeah, um, do you take um like into is part of the data like the humidity level of that day and like the weather and stuff? Yes, yeah. So I track all of that and um I'm also tracking like so I don't do this for every read, but I'm tracking how much I'm taking off at, during each stage and like how long it's sitting between stages. Okay. Um and then I'm taking more like common measurements like diameter um like the accuracy of the guard of the gouge um and stuff like that so um yeah i could get into <laughs> get into all of that i have a like a whole big binder full of um data points that i collect um, yeah wow that's really interesting yeah. that's awesome yeah yeah it's it's fun um and tedious and <laughs> yeah i don't sure. do it i don't do it for every read yeah 
Um, cause I found if I did it with, for every single read, I think I would probably go a little bit insane, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> at least more insane than I already am. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, you know, some reads I'll just start and make without collecting much data at all besides the like general things that we would write in a read journal. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. I'm learning a lot about how I scrape and, you know, inconsistencies in the things I do and things that I am doing consistent and yeah. Yeah, totally. That's awesome. Yeah. It's been interesting. Do you keep any sort of read journal? Um, not currently. Um, mm -hmm. I should, I feel like I have a really hard time with getting myself to like write down things. That's fair. Um, <laughs> but, um, I do, I recently kind of started using a micrometer definitely for like my day one, the first, like on my day one reads and like, just to get like my heart really consistent across at like 45 and, um, and trying to like build from there just to create more consistent consistency in my reads. Um, but I yeah. don't typically keep like, a track of, of everything. So are you in your last year of your master's? Yes, I'm almost done. Nice. Congrats. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm very excited um, to finish out. Um, although I'm also sad that I will be in my first year and forever and not taking lessons and stuff. I think that will be <laughs> oh, <hard> yeah. <laughs> me, But <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Um, I really like being in school um, for the most part, um, but I've been in school since kindergarten like I never took any yeah. between my <laughs> undergrad and, and grad school so I'm definitely feeling a little bit of like school burnout and school fatigue right. um, yeah. especially like just being online all the time has been really challenging for me but um yeah I'm still happy that I decided to like stick it out this year uh for yeah. a little bit I was considering just like deferring this year and coming back in like a more like in-person semester but I'm definitely happy I stuck it out because I think I have learned a lot about like myself and my remaking and my practice strategies and stuff, like having to be more independent um, without nice. like a in-person, like studio teacher to lean on and, and stuff. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. How yeah. have you like kind of managed your burnout or like your, you know, um, the lack of energy or like, you know, motivation, how have you like found motivation during this time? Cause I know we've had some submitted questions in previous weeks about, how do I motivate myself right now? So how, yeah. how have you done that? Yeah. Um, the biggest thing for me has been um, setting like better boundaries for myself with school. Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely someone who like, if I could just go every day, like, and work for like 16 hours and like practice all the time and make reads all the time, like I would do it because yeah. I <laughs> have that like, I need this. I'm like, so type A, <laughs> just like, just, I'm just like that. Um, which in the past has really caused me some like really like bad periods of like, I don't, I can't do this. Like it's so much. I'm so tired, like blah, blah, blah. Um, so like last semester and this semester too, like I was really like, just like, I'm, I'm going to wake up every day and I'm going to give the day like a hundred percent of me. And like, I'm going to do like my absolute best at everything every day. And like, I can't do more than what my best is. So I'm not going to like try and be like someone or, or produce something that I like know that I'm just physically incapable of like producing in that day. And I'm not going to be mad at myself if I can't produce that. Um, mm -hmm. And being like, okay with just giving my best and being okay with like what that is, where whatever it is. Um, yeah. And also just like listening to myself of like when I need to like take a break and go outside for a walk or like, take a break and like call a friend and talk um, or just like call it for the night. And like, yeah, just like really setting like boundaries with myself um, in every part of my life has been like really helpful um, for my motivation. And then when I am in a period of, of not motivating, um, depending on what that is. So like if that's practicing, um, something that I like to do is just 
um, taking out my instrument and finding something that I really enjoy playing. So whether that's like a Barrett melody or like um, something I really like is the second etude in the Boza etude. Mm -hmm. It's like ba da 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 da. It's based on something that I'm forgetting right now. But um, <laughs> I just like love to play that, and so I'll just nice. get up there and play it at like my own speed and my own um, like just like however it makes me feel good and usually like after 10 minutes of that I'll be like okay like I'm in the zone now and I'm gonna practice and that ends nice. up being like a two-hour session that I normally would do um so that's been helpful for me um and also Angela's key of the day sometimes I just like don't know oh, what yeah. to warm up in so I'll be like okay what key am I doing today like thank you Angela for choosing that for me <laughs> yeah I love that yeah yeah um and then for read making like where I go through spells of like being unmotivated to make reads um I've tried to make like the environment as like fun as possible so like sometimes I'll uh like put on some like nice music or like a tv show that I really like to watch or I I really like to diffuse like lavender oil in the air because uh -huh. I feel like that helps me calm down and like kind of get into just like a chill like I'm just here making reads like it's not stressful <laughs> I love that. Um, sort yeah. of environment so yeah just being aware of like what might be causing you to be unmotivated and like if you just need to sleep and not practice your oboe like that's then just do that and don't beat yourself up for like taking the night off of of a session yeah. or something yeah yeah that's great advice yeah mm -hmm. I think and kind of that might made me think of one thing that used to bug me a lot was like when I was in school and like maybe I didn't get my hour of scales in like one day you know and I'm like I would beat myself up over one day of not getting it in but definitely take a look at like the bigger picture you know try to zoom out and and see that okay I've been I've done my scales you know six days this week I'm probably okay if one day I don't <laughs> do all my scales. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's great like, advice. You know, like the world's not end. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Olivia, for joining me. Um, I really enjoyed chatting with you and getting to know you more and learning about the way you make reads and, and all of that. So thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, this has been so great. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah. I hope you have a good rest of your semester and good finish out a good year um, of your master's. Yeah, congrats. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great uh, rest yeah. of your semester with like the business and everything too. So thanks. Bye, Logan. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Bye. See ya.